about the turning points of the Civil War. And I've told you before, when we studied the wars uh, in this class, particularly the Revolutionary War and now the Civil War, I told you that we're really not going to go over a battle by battle, the detail of those wars. Uh, this isn't a military history class. It's more of a general overview of U.S. history. So uh, we don't focus a whole lot on uh, numerous specific battles uh, in these wars. Uh, however, I've told you before, we at least want to make sure we know uh, the battles that started the war, uh, the battles that ended the war, and the turning points of the war. Uh, so today we're going to focus on the turning points of the Civil War. And um, oddly and coincidentally enough, uh, they take place basically on July 4th, uh, the first few days of July, July 1st through 4th. These two different battles, now I would argue there's really two turning points of the Civil War. One took place in the north at Gettysburg. One took place in the south at Vicksburg. And they both end on July 3rd, July 4th. Uh, so we continue to see July 4th uh, is really s almost a magical day in U.S. history. Obviously, it was the day the Declaration of Independence was adopted. That's what it's most famous for. I've told you before that on the 50th anniversary of that uh, July 4th of adopting the Declaration, both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on the same day. Uh, there was a third president, I believe it was James Monroe, also died on July 4th. And now during the Civil War, uh, these two battles, both of them Union victories, uh, both taking place uh, an ending on July 3rd and July 4th, respectively. Uh, really keep the Union together. So let's start with uh, perhaps the most famous battle of the Civil War, uh, perhaps the most famous battle in all of U.S. history, Gettysburg. Now, in one of our previous lectures, we talked about how the South did real well when it was fighting uh, in the South, uh, but Lee felt it was necessary if he was going to bring this war to a somewhat speedy uh, resolution that he needed to invade the North. Uh, in a previous episode, we talked about when Lee invaded Maryland, lost in Antietam, had to retreat. Jumping ahead now to July of 1863, uh, generally, once again, tries to invade the North. And Lee's forces end up meeting the Union forces uh, at a place called Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and they fight for three consecutive days on July 1st through July 3rd. One hundred sixty five thousand troops took part in the battle. Uh, Fifty one thousand troops were either killed or wounded. Uh, once again, we are seeing uh, enormous death and wounded uh, figures come out of this war. And Gettysburg was certainly uh, up there at the top of the list as, as far as the deadliest battles of the war. or Any other battle uh, the U.S. has ever fought. Now, the two sides battle uh, more or less at a stalemate the first couple days, July 1st, July 2nd. Uh, neither side really has, uh, has won an advantage either of those two days. Uh, so they get ready to fight a third day. And Lee, in perhaps his most controversial decision of the war, orders one of his generals, George Pickett, to attack the middle of the Union lines. Uh, the previous day, I believe Lee had sent some forces trying to get to what are called the flanks on the outside, go around and come at the Union from the side. Those didn't make any progress. So Lee believed that the Union, uh, who's led by a guy named General Meade, M-E-A-D-E, uh, 
that Meade had and the Union had weakened their forces in the middle trying to protect their flanks the day before. So Lee tells George Pickett uh, to gather up a bunch of divisions and attack the Union straight ahead. And this is going to turn out to be a mistake and a disaster for the Confederacy and a great victory for the Union. Okay. Uh, I've read before that uh, during what is called Pickett's Charge, or Pickett's Men Charge directly uh, into the Union forces, that they crossed a field that was basically about three quarters of a mile long or wide, however you want to describe it. Uh, so essentially, the Union uh, knew exactly where the Confederates were coming from and had a pretty good amount of time uh, to get ready uh, and battle them. And the Union was able to repel uh, the Confederate forces. Uh, Lee ultimately and the Confederacy lose up to a third of their troops are either dead or wounded. Uh, I believe the numbers, like in Pickett's actual division, the division of soldiers that Pickett was in charge of, I believe the numbers may have, after the charge, may have been as high as over 40%. Uh, so this was a great number of deaths uh, to the Confederacy. Now, there were a lot of deaths and, and wounded soldiers for the Union as well. But as we've talked about in prior lectures, the Union had so many more soldiers to lose uh, that the, the number, the sheer numbers of of deaths and wounded soldiers, casualties, uh, didn't deplete the Union numbers as much as it did the Confederates. Uh, so once again, just like at Antietam, uh, Lee loses much of his army, and so he has to turn around and retreat to Virginia. And this would be the last time, now the war is going to go on for another two years after this, or almost two years anyway, this would be the last time Lee and the Union Army attack the North. The rest of the Civil War would be take place entirely within the Confederate States. At the same time, Lee is attacking in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. General Grant uh, is in Mississippi trying to get control of Vicksburg. Now, remember uh, from a previous lecture, we talked about the Union strategy was called the Anaconda Plan. They were going to basically squeeze uh, the South to death, prevent them from resupplying, getting supplies. Uh, part of that plan was to put a blockade uh, across the Atlantic Ocean uh, to cut off the port of New Orleans so that the South could not get supplies from Europe. Another part of that plan, though, was to take control of the Mississippi River. Once again, if you control the Mississippi River, you can control trade in North America. So now in 1862, the Union had set up the blockade. They'd, they'd taken the port of New Orleans. But the South could still uh, trade up and down the Mississippi River within the Confederacy. And as I told you, basically, if you took me last year for Texas history and then earlier in one of these lectures, Texas played a key role in supplying the, the South, the Confederacy. Uh, they could get supplies in either the Texas coast or smuggle them up through Mexico and then distribute those uh, supplies throughout the Confederacy. However, if the Union is able to get con full control of the Mississippi River, then they've cut that off. Uh, and the Confederacy, most of which is between the Mississippi River and the Atlantic uh, Ocean, and that's where most of or all the fighting, not, not all, most of the fighting is going to take place the rest of the war. Uh, then the South will really be cut off if they lose the Mississippi River. And that was the Union and General Grant's plan. Uh, because Vicksburg was the last part of the Mississippi River still held by the Confederacy. And so in the spring, early summer of 1863, this is where Grant uh, aims his forces. Now, Grant had tried to attack Vicksburg a couple times, but those attacks failed. These occurred in May of 1863. Uh, Pittsburgh is a city right on the river. It was heavily fortified. 
uh, based on where you're coming from the river, it was high up, so they had the best um, advantages. And so they were able to repel the attacks. So Grant just decided to set up a siege of the city. So the siege begins in May of 1863. And we've seen sieges before. If you recall back in the Revolutionary War, it was a siege of Yorktown. Uh, where General Washington, uh, with his French allies, were able to besiege the city of Yorktown, trap uh, Cornwallis and the British troops inside there. Uh, that led to victory in the Revolutionary War. And as we're going to see, Grant's siege of Vicksburg is going to uh, suddenly lead to victory in Vicksburg and a larger scale set up a victory in the Civil War as well. Now, the siege lasts almost six weeks. And eventually, uh, because they can't get supplies into the city, uh, the Confederates begin running out of food. And they ultimately surrender on July 4th, 1863. So again, we saw the Battle of Gettysburg in July 3rd, 1863. We see the Battle of Pittsburgh end on July 4th, 1863. Grant's army captured, uh, as you see on the screen, uh, basically 30,000 prisoners. And just as importantly, they controlled all of the Mississippi River, which essentially cut the Confederacy in half. Uh, because of uh, where the Mississippi River runs, Texas, Arkansas, and Louisiana are now on the west side of the river. They're really cut off from the rest of the Confederacy. All right, and so the Confederacy only had 11 states to begin with. Now you've separated three from the, the other eight. And by this point, particularly when you couple uh, the Battle of Vic or the Siege of Vicksburg with the, the Union victory at Gettysburg, a Union victory uh, was probably inevitable. Uh, it, it's hard to conceive of a way that the South was going to be able to ultimately win this war. Uh, once they were uh, lost control of the Mississippi River at Vicksburg and after they had been twice defeated in their attempts to attack uh, territory in the north at Antietam and Gettysburg. Again, it's always easy to look back, um, you know, almost 160 years later and look back and say, OK, yes, the South was done for after Vicksburg and Gettysburg. Uh, but it is hard to imagine a scenario after these battles where the South was going to, to ultimately be victorious. And so the, the tide of the Civil War really changed after these battles. Now, one interesting point, as maybe you picked up on, you know, the two leading military figures in this war are General Lee for the Confederacy and General Grant for the Union Army. But as you may have picked up on the fact, General Lee was off in Pennsylvania fighting while Grant was in Vicksburg. And a couple of this goes back to um, a point that I made in one of the previous lectures. Grant did not start off the head of the Union Army. Lee was in charge of the Confederate Army almost from the get-go. And so his army was focused on uh, the eastern part where most of the population was, where both capitals, Washington, D.C., and the capital of Confederacy in Richmond, Virginia. They were both centered in the East. Uh, so that's where Lee, as in charge of the entire Confederate Army, uh, was based. Grant did not start off uh, as uh, the head of the Union Army. He didn't even start off as a general. He, he moved his way up. And so Grant spent most of the first few years of the war uh, fighting in, in the West, Tennessee, Mississippi. Again, we don't really consider that part of the Western part of the United States today, but at the time of the Civil War, that was really part of the West. And so Grant's there the first couple of years of the war. It's not going to be really until 1864 and into 1865 uh, that Grant and Lee actually start battling directly against each other. They spend the first few years of the war uh, in different parts of the country fighting uh, different generals. So even though uh, they are the the two generals we associate with each side 
Um, they don't really fight each other for the first half of the war. Uh, but as it turns out, uh, during this time period, Grant was ultimately successful at taking Vicksburg, uh, where Lee was unsuccessful at taking Gettysburg, and so that sets up uh, the tide of the war to change. Go through this. That was something we were going to talk about if we did this in class, uh, but we'll skip it for now. Okay. One last point. Uh, the Gettysburg Address. Now, this should not be a surprise to you since I've had uh, the entire Gettysburg Address, the, the entire text of the Gettysburg Address on a poster outside the wall of my classroom for the entire year. Uh, you've lined up uh, standing right beside this poster all year long. But it's become one of the two most famous speeches in American history. Uh, probably if there's a more famous speech than the Gettysburg Address, it'd be Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech uh, during the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, but the Gettysburg Address is, is every bit um, as famous as any other speech in American history. And several months after the war, uh, no, Lincoln uh, traveled to Gettysburg uh, to help open a battlefield cemetery. They're going to what they call consecrate the land, make it sacred, create a cemetery there for the thousands and thousands of people who died at Gettysburg. And so he took the occasion to give a speech now known as the Gettysburg Address. And the speech is, is less than three minutes long. Uh, he wrote it, uh, the legend is he wrote it on the back of an envelope uh, when he was on a train heading from Washington to Gettysburg. Uh, but what Lincoln says is the speech is that the soldiers who died at Gettysburg uh, didn't die in vain, uh, but that they died to preserve self-government. Uh, he begins uh, the speech talking about, you know, you've had this government, self-government, 87 years. Now, what he, the most famous lines are four score and seven years ago. Uh, score means 20. That's another term for 20. So four score, four times 20 is 80. Four score and seven is 87 years ago. He talks about how the founding fathers created this, this new type of government, the self-government, where it's going to be ruled by kings or queens, but people are going to govern themselves. And Lincoln describes Gettysburg as another step in saving self-government, not only for the United States, but for the world. All right, America has always seen itself as sort of a model of self-government uh, because when it was created in the 1700s, there weren't a whole lot of other places where you had self-government. It was mostly kings and queens. So Lincoln talks about how these soldiers made the sacrifice at Gettysburg to preserve self-government, uh, not only in the U.S., but throughout the world. And in uh, the most ironic statement, he, towards the end of the speech, he says, no one is going to remember what I say here today, uh, but we should all remember what the soldiers did here in July. And of course, while everybody does remember the battles of Get Gettysburg, uh, everybody's also remembered exactly what Lincoln said there that day. So um, that's the turning point. Uh, as I said earlier, it's hard to imagine the South uh, pulling victory, um, pulling a victory out of Jaws of Defeat at this point um, in the war. Uh, but the war is going to last for another basically 21 months or so. Uh, after Gettysburg and Pittsburgh, and next lecture, we will talk about some of the other events and then what leads to the ultimate end of the war.